Hi everyone, I'm Neil Harding. I'm Mark Ashworth. Okay, and welcome to Property Insight. Today we're going to be talking about all the things you need to do as a landlord to stay compliant um, when you're about to let a property. So you uh, may be about to market your property for letting. You might have actually found a, a tenant that you would like to move into your property. Um, but there are various things that you need to be doing to make sure you stay on the right side of the law in regulations and compliance. So we're going to talk through the main ones. First one is how to rent guide. So a few years ago, the government decided that they were going to produce a document uh, that needed to be provided to tenants to give them all the information about what they need to look out for when they're renting a property. So what rights they have, what rights the landlord have, the general kind of uh, protocol around renting property. Um, and now that how to rent guide is on the government website. If you just do a search for how to rent .gov, and it will come up on the website. And I believe you can even subscribe to it to make sure that it's up to date. And um, so as and when they make changes to it, I mean, you should make sure that you're serving the correct version and you must by law serve that documentation to the tenant when they probably when they actually first apply for becoming a tenant. If it's not served and you don't have proof of serving that notice, then if there is any struggle later on to remove the tenant from the property, um, you will struggle to do so. So it is mm. a compliance um, part, part of the compliance that they served. And you also need to check that your letting agent that are actually doing that as well most credible ones will be doing so, but obviously it's a good idea to check. Yeah, I've seen tenancy agreements where as part of the signing of the tenancy agreement, the tenants also sign in to say that they've received a copy of the how to rent guide, which is a good way to do it. Energy performance certificates are another one. So EPCs um, came in a few years ago now and um, they're graded according to letters A down to, I think maybe the bottom one's an F or a G. The minimum standard at the moment, 2023, is that a property needs to be an E grade or higher in order to legally let a property. And the EPC document needs to be available for inspection before you've actually even started marketing the property for let. So this comes quite an early stage. So you could put that um, certificate um, on, online or you could put it in the property when you do viewings, but it does need to be provided up front. So it has to be an E or higher. Um, so that all the EPCs are currently uh, registered online. So you can actually do a search for the address of the property before you've even bought the property. If you haven't bought it yet, then you can find out what the EPC rating is. As I say, it's all online. Uh, the document lasts or has a period lifespan valid the validity of 10 years. So if you do buy a property and it happens to expire before you let out that uh, to a new tenant, you need to obviously have it renewed by doing another assessment, let's say, of the property. Also, the other thing to say is that if your tenant is in the property while the EPC expires, you don't actually have to provide a new EPC until the next tenancy starts. Another requirement is electrical safety certificates. And just picking up on what you've just said there about um, how often do they need to be done. I, I, I often hear from people about electrical safety certificates. Um, they need to be provided um, for every property that's let and they're valid for five years. And people often ask me, you know, do they need to be redone if there's a change in tenancy, which might be in the middle of that five year period? And m my understanding is no, they, they don't need to be redone. It's only every five years. Again, you may decide that you want a new electrical safety certificate done. Electricians will, will tell you it's probably best practice to do that, but it's really down to landlord choice really. But the, the legal requirement is that they're done every five years. The other thing, of course, that you need to have a legal requirement for is a gas safety certificate. And for sure, if that's been done while, uh, you know, it's, let's say it's still in date, which is for a year, that lasts for a year. If it's in date when you have a new tenant, as long as it's in date, you don't have to have it redone at the point of, of, um, of the new tenancy coming in. I would echo really what Neil said, um, and it's really down to personal choice. But um, yeah, um, and it's called an electrical condition inspection report. ECIR is the report, and they're typically a bit more expensive than a gas safe, probably about £200 or something like that. The next one is something that is often much to the frustration of landlords, I think, where the government decided a few years ago to effectively outsource 
it's border force uh, responsibilities to some extent in a way to landlords and we provide a nice free service to to the, the country to make sure that those that rent in in the UK have the legal right to do so so that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek um, but what I'm saying there but it is a, a responsibility and if we don't do it we are, there are actually serious fines thousands of pounds for um, renting a property to someone that isn't legally entitled to be in the UK a simple way to do that is to take a, a, a check on, on someone's passport to make sure they're a British citizen. But of course, there are other reasons why someone is legally entitled to be in the UK. So that could be right to remain, indefinite leave, or they could have refugee status, or they could have temporary home office um, permission to be in the UK for whatever reason. But all those things are acceptable, but you do have to do that check to make sure that they are legally entitled. And there is some responsibility on the tenant to make sure that they have proved their right to rent. Um, so if they are a UK citizen or a UK or Ireland citizen and they've provided their passport and you've checked to make sure that it is a legitimate document, you've checked the original, which is important. So it's always a good idea to get a copy of it, make sure you keep it in a safe and compliant way, but also see the original when they actually check in. But if they're not a UK resident originally, don't have a UK passport, then they can just complete an easy form on the government website. Once they've completed that information, they can actually provide you with what's called a share code. And then you enter that share code into the Gov website, along with a little bit of personal information about the tenant. I think it's their date of birth you put in. Um, that will then give you a document which basically has a photo of the tenant, which obviously they've provided. And it then tells you on there how long they have the right to remain in the UK and the right to rent in the UK. Obviously, if that comes up and it doesn't give you the correct response, you know that potentially they don't have the right to rent. So it is down to you as a landlord to check those um, check that document. And, you know, in fairness to the government, they have made that a more simple process. What about tenancy damage deposits? Oh, so the, the dreaded damage, damage deposit. deposits. Yeah, I do. I guess you yeah. take damage deposits yeah. for all of yours. Yeah, so I do mine in a slight... I, do, I have two ways of doing mine. So I have all of my single let tenancies are done with it, within the custodial system, which essentially means that you pay them, that they're paid into a third party uh, government backed system. There are three deposit protection service, also known as yep. the DPS, my deposits, yep. and also tenancy deposit scheme. So there are three that are backed um, and, and official by the government and you have to use one of those three schemes. So the tenant pays the money and then that is lodged and you have a record of it. And then when it comes to the end of a tenancy, you agree uh, how much is to be given back, whether it's all of it or a portion of it. And that's a relatively easy process. Both sides log in and what you've agreed. And if there's an agreement between the two of you, that's not an issue. If there is a dispute about that, then obviously they have a team of people to be able to then uh, manage that dispute through to decide what you're going to get and what the landlord's going to get. For shared accommodation, I use what's called an insured scheme, which means I hold the deposit money uh, and I use an insurance policy, which is a small amount of premium, which basically is there in order to protect the tenant's deposit in the event of a dispute. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because typically shared accommodation tenants uh, tend to have some element of cost at the end of their, their tenancy. Often they don't leave the room particularly clean and tidy. Uh, they sometimes leave without paying the last week or two weeks rent. So therefore, sometimes that tenancy deposit needs to be retained. So therefore, uh, we find that it's just an easier process from an administration point of view to use the insurance scheme on that. If you're using the insurance scheme for your single let tenants, you're taking five weeks deposit. That could be in the region of over, well over a thousand pounds. I think it's advisable to have that in a separate place. Our, our room deposits tend to be a lot lower. Yeah, and if you take if you take a damage deposit from a tenant, that five weeks rule. So that is, the damage deposit can't be greater than five weeks worth of rent in value. And if you do take a damage deposit, it does need to be paid to one of the three approved schemes that Mark's just described there within 30 days of, of taking yeah. the cash, it has to be handed over to within 30 days. There were uh, rules brought in in, I think, the summer of 2022 around carbon monoxide and smoke alarms and tests uh, that need to be done on that, which I think was great that the law has changed. I think it makes properties safer and hopefully people were doing this anyway. But um, for smoke alarms, there's a requirement for a smoke alarm to be on any floor of a property that's let um, where there is living accommodation, which for all intents and purposes really would include most floors, I think really. So certainly bedrooms, lounges and what have you. So if you've got a, uh, a two-story house, you would need a smoke alarm on, on both floors. 
And there is a requirement as well on the landlord that you test the smoke alarm to show and prove that it's working on at least an annual basis and that you demonstrate with the tenant on the start of the, at the start of the tenancy that the smoke alarm is working and they, and they know how it, how it works. But the, the emphasis there is now that the responsibility is on the landlord to make sure that smoke alarms are working. And then on a carbon monoxide, uh, carbon monoxide tests um, and alarms need to be provided in properties as well. Wherever there is a combustible device or essentially a gas boiler yeah. or, or a gas cooker, then if you have that, then you need to have a carbon monoxide test as well. The main other thing as well, which, which is perhaps the most important and perhaps the most obvious is that um, as landlords, we, we do need to provide good quality homes and accommodation for people. It might sound obvious to say so, but there is a law as well around the, the Landlord and Tenant Act. And you know, properties need to be free from damp and mold, structurally sound and safe, secure quality accommodation. Hopefully for all the landlords watching that, that's gonna be what you are doing in a way and always intended to do. And if you, you weren't, then it's perhaps landlording is not the best thing for you, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, but but you know we you know Mark and I always pride ourselves on the on the accommodation that we provide, and uh, it really is important that you provide quality accommodation and somewhere for, to live. It's someone's home at the end of the day. Absolutely. So I think that wrap, wraps up things for compliance um, stuff that you need to give to your tenants, make sure that they've uh, they've got everything they need. So um, we really do hope that you found that insightful, and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Thanks.